disinformation machinery could plant the idea on virgin soil. Codenamed Operation Dragon, it has become one of the most successful disinformation operations in contemporary history. Blaming the CIA for the KGB's own assassinations and kidnappings abroad was a disinformation tactic that had been introduced by Khrushchev. It essentially killed two birds with one stone. The CIA is by far the world's best intelligence organization. It decisively contributed to the Cold War victory, and it became the world's first line of defense against terrorism and nuclear proliferation. By portraying it as a criminal organization, the KGB hoped to diminish its ability to recruit human assets. To add more fuel, the official Soviet line spread on Oswald was, he never was trusted during his stay in Russia, and was suspected of being a CIA agent. A very clever master of deception, Yuri Andropov, once told me, if a good piece of this information is repeated over and over, after a while it will take on a life of its own and will all by itself generate a horde of unwitting but passionate advocates. The greatest and grandest of all conspiracy theories was born, and it has never stopped. Numerous books have been written and films made about the assassination of Kennedy. Public opinion polls have consistently shown that a majority of Americans believe <coughs> there was a conspiracy to kill President Kennedy. The first piece of irrefutable evidence proving that the KGB had launched a disinformation offensive was released by Boris Yeltsin. In his memoir, The Struggle for Russia, Yeltsin revealed a letter to the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union dated November 23, 1963, the day after the assassination. Signed by the KGB chairman, the letter recommended publishing in a progressive paper in one of the Western countries an article exposing the attempt by reactionary circles in the USA to remove the responsibility for the murder of Kennedy from the real criminals, those being the racists and ultra-right elements guilty of the spread and growth of violence and terror in the United States. Two months later, R. Palm Dutt, the editor of a communist-controlled British journal, Labor Monthly, published an article that raised the specter of CIA involvement without offering a scintilla of evidence. In 1992, the British smuggled Vasily Metrokin, a KGB archivist, out of the Soviet Union along with some 25,000 highly classified copies from the KGB archives. Those documents represented just a, a minuscule part of the whole KGB archive. But nevertheless, the FBI described that archive as the most complete and extensive intelligence ever received from any source. The biggest counterintelligence bonanza of the post-war period. Among the most important revelations provided by the archive are the highly classified KGB documents, proving that the Kennedy assassination conspiracy was born in and partially funded by the KGB. The documents revealed that the first book on the assassination, Oswald, Assassin or Fall Guy, was authored by a former member of the German Communist Party and published in New York by a KGB agent who received subsidies totaling $672,000 <coughs> from the Central Committee of the Communist Party. It is noteworthy that the book saw the light of day before the Warren Commission report was published. It also follows the Dragon Operation guidelines by describing Oswald as an FBI agent with a CIA background who was used to shield the real assassins, a group of American right-wing conspirators. In 1988, New Orleans attorney Jim <coughs> Harrison's book on the trail of the assassins claimed that the Kennedy assassination was the result of a conspiracy at the highest level of the government. Inspired by Garrison's book, Oliver Stone's movie JFK, claimed that members of the military, industrial complex, the CIA, the FBI, the Secret Service, the Mafia, and Lyndon Johnson were behind the assassination. The movie won two Academy Awards, and many Americans believe the film is fact. Stone, the king of Hollywood disinformation, once again turned history inside out. Oliver made a film about JFK that we all know is riddled with tremendous conspiracies as if Oliver <coughs> really killed JFK. Now, that, like, what, what's good about that film? good, I mean, safe about it, is it is so absurd that it really looks like it's fabrication. Many people still dismiss the lone gunman theory, saying that one man could not bring down the world's most powerful person. On Monday, March 30th, 1981, a lone gunman came within inches of taking down President Ronald Reagan.
United States ships on the high seas in the Gulf of Tonkin have today required me to order the military forces of the United States to take action and reply. In August of 1964, two attacks on American ships off the coast of North Vietnam would signal the beginning of another hot war in the Cold War struggle. On March 8, 1965, 3,500 U.S. Marines land near Da Nang in South Vietnam. On March 19, 1965, Gheorghe Dej, Romania's first communist dictator, dies. Three days later, officials of the Politburo turn to Nicolae Ceausescu and elect him general secretary, thus beginning the 30-year rule of one of the most corrupt and brutal dictators in history. Nicolae and Elena Ceausescu would institute a cult of personality, turning Romania into a laboratory for fear, misery, and poverty. In June of 1967, the fast and decisive six-day war in the Middle East came to an abrupt end. Victorious Israeli forces had taken control of the Sinai Peninsula and the Gaza Strip from Egypt, the West Bank and East Jerusalem from Jordan, and the Golan Heights from Syria. The defeat of the Soviet-backed countries of Egypt and Syria would have repercussions for many years to come. On the December 1968 cover of Time magazine, Yasser Arafat's face was seen by the world for the first time. Arafat was a product of the Kremlin's science of disinformation, and he ultimately became an expert in manipulating this invisible weapon. As a first step, the KGB destroyed the official records of Arafat's birth in Egypt, replacing them with fictitious documents that he had been born in Jerusalem. It amazes me at what great lengths the KGB took to transform an Egyptian-born Marxist into the Palestinian-born terrorist Yasser Arafat. It took the KGB many years to endow Arafat with a credible birth certificate, other identity documents, to build him a new past and to train him at the KGB Special Operations Training School east of Moscow. The KGB gave Arafat an ideology and an ideological image. The Soviet disinformation machinery portrayed Arafat as a rabid anti-Zionist, an image that was not at all difficult. The Russians trained the Terrorist organizations that we see today, the, the Ayatollah Khomeini and his people, they were also trained by the Soviets. Yasser Arafat was trained by the Soviets. Uh, Mr. Pacheppa is a good witness uh, for that too. Oleg Gordievsky, a former KGB officer who defected to Britain, revealed that in the 70s, the KGB had secretly brought Arafat's terrorists into the Soviet Union to be trained. The KGB disinformation department tasked Arafat to create and head a terrorist group named Fatah, and in the aftermath of the Six-Day War, it catapulted him up as chairman of the PLO. The Matrokin archive also details Arafat's close collaboration with the KGB. In 1978, Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev and his KGB chairman Yuri Andropov started a disinformation plot. The goal? Get the United States to establish diplomatic relations with Arafat. The idea was simple. Have Arafat pretend to transform the terrorist PLO into a government in exile that was willing to renounce terrorism. Brezhnev and Andropov believed that newly elected President Jimmy Carter would swallow the bait. As Washington's most favorite tyrant, Moscow gave Ceausescu the job. Ceausescu envisioned that this disinformation plot might bring the Nobel Peace Prize to both Arafat and himself. That year, I accompanied Ceausescu to Washington, where he convinced Carter that he could persuade Arafat to transform his PLO into a law-abiding government in exile. If the United States would establish official relations, of course. In 1994, Arafat was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Yet in 2002 alone, there were over 13,000 incidents of terrorism against Israelis committed by Arafat's PLO. Six months later, the number of Israeli civilians killed by Arafat's martyrs exceeded 700. Few people have noticed that Mahmoud Abbas, who took Arafat's place, was educated in the former Soviet Union. Abbas graduated from Patrice Lumumba University in Moscow, a KGB-controlled school whose secret task was to create a new generation of foreigners dedicated to promoting the Kremlin's interests. Vietnam. United States helicopter gunships backed up ground forces in a strong assault on a Viet Cong position only three miles from Saigon's Tan Son Luc Air Base. Arnaud de Borkroff has played a role in world affairs known to no other journalist. 
He served as chief correspondent for Newsweek and was later appointed editor-in-chief for the Washington Times. The uh, North Vietnamese were very clever in exercising disinformation, as were the Soviets, about the Vietnam War. They had made themselves out to be the good guys against the American puppets that were considered the bad guys. And uh, disinformation was so effective in the United States, much more than it was in Vietnam, which led some of the North Vietnamese generals in their memoirs after the war, they were amazed to see how they were winning something called the Tet Offensive in uh, 1968, that they had won that offensive, when the exact opposite was true. They attacked 27 cities simultaneously. And uh, the South Vietnamese and us, sometimes together, sometimes the South Vietnamese alone, kicked them out of every single city within 24 hours. And yet, uh, Walter Cronkite, yeah. uh, and I was on the roof of the Caravelle Hotel when he arrived with his flag jacket and helmet. We were in safari suits, sipping a gin and tonic. There was no danger whatsoever at that particular moment on the roof of the Caravelle Hotel. And he broadcast to the world, we've lost the war. And Lyndon Johnson, the president at the time, said if Walter Cronkite is against me, I can't run for re-election. By 1968, the small war in Vietnam had grown to its peak. America engaged in a limited war as part of a strategy to contain the spread of communism without provoking a wider confrontation with the Soviet Union. The Soviet disinformation machine took full advantage of the situation. America, most of us don't realize this, was winning the Vietnam War. And if you think about it, the United States of America can beat a little country like North Vietnam in battle. How could they not? And the Soviets knew this, because this was basically a kind of a proxy war between the U.S. and the Soviet Union being fought in Vietnam. And so the only way they could really win would be to mess around with the hearts and minds of Americans, basically to demoralize Americans, turn them against the war effort, and then get Congress, as it eventually did, to cut and run. On April 22nd, 1971, a former Navy lieutenant testified to the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. They had personally raped, cut off ears, cut off heads, taped wires from portable telephones to human genitals and turned up the power, cut off limbs, blown up bodies, randomly shot at civilians, raised villages in a fashion reminiscent of Genghis Khan. Although Kerry never fully revealed the source of the accusations, I recognized them as being the product of another KGB disinformation operation. Senator Kerry uh, went through his medals over the White House fence in protest. Well, that was all a ploy to increase his status and, and draw attention to him. But the reality is the things that he testified as to having seen, he never saw those things. Uh, he was perpetuating the, the myth of the left about our young men and women that served in Vietnam. And uh, I, think, I think it's high time for Senator Kerry to come clean and, and apologize for what he did. We expect this of the Soviets, okay? They were our enemy. By proxy, they were the enemy we were fighting in Vietnam. We don't expect this from a person like John Kerry. And that message was carried forth by the so-called mainstream news media in the U.S. Throughout history, Americans had never before been anti-American. They were always a proud and independent people who loved their country and who won every military conflict up until its wars against communism. Then suddenly, a number of Americans began turning against their country's own wars. By 1968, the anti-Vietnam War protesters in the U.S. numbered almost 7 million. They came to regard their own government not communism as the enemy. The general perception in the U.S. is that America's anti-war movement was a homegrown product. In reality, it was the result of a still very secret disinformation operation ignited by the KGB. Its purpose was twofold. First, to counteract American efforts to stop communist expansion. And second, to create doubt around the world about American power, judgment, and credibility. It fulfilled both aims. KGB chief Yuri Andropov baptized the operation Ares after the great god of war. 
and Dropov was convinced that the war in Vietnam provided a once-in-a-lifetime chance to make Europe fear America's military terror, and he made Operation Ares a foremost priority. In order to conceal its hand, in 1967, the KGB created the so-called Stockholm Conference on Vietnam and staffed it with undercover KGB officers. This new front organization received an average of $15 million yearly from the Soviet Communist Party. During the five years of its existence, it spread around the world countless scathing disinformation articles and photographs, supposedly depicting the debaucheries committed by the Genghis Khan-style American military against Vietnamese civilians. In a long discussion with Andropov about Operation Ares, he said that it, it turned America against our own government. It damaged America's foreign policy consensus, poisoned her domestic debate, and transformed the world's leftist into deadly enemies of American imperialism. He said, all we have to do is to continue planting the seeds of Ares, and eventually, American leftists would start pursuing it of their own accord. In the end, our original involvement would be forgotten and, and Ares would, would take on a life of its own. Sadly, Andropov's prediction came true. The U.S. elections of 1974 brought in a new Congress dominated by leftist Democrats who immediately restricted the financing of the war in Vietnam and in 1976 cut the funding altogether. As the U.S. forces precipitously pulled out of Vietnam, the victorious communists massacred some two million people. Soviet Union had an agenda. Again, it, it, it's something that people don't get a, even today. They think Putin is just another guy. I mean, the Soviet Union wanted to take over the world. So even Vietnam War, I, I, I meet people, intelligent people, who are totally confused about the Vietnam War. My secretary is proud that she marched, changed herself, and, uh, you know, make love, not war. I mean, it was terribly executed, but, but the goal, America had to stop the spread of communism. It, it is like, like cancer, basically. In 1972, my life changed dramatically. Ceausescu made me the deputy chief of the Foreign Intelligence Service. Within a short time, I had absolute power over all the top organizations dealing with the West. So I was now inside the inner circle, and I saw up close Ceausescu, the country's idolized leader. It shocked me to find he didn't give a damn about the country. All he cared about was his power. And his illiterate wife was even more disgusting, spending vast sums of the country's money on herself. They both wanted to create their own dynasty for Romania. I traveled throughout that whole country, and the only picture billboard you ever saw was Elena and Nikolai Ceausescu's picture. Throughout the whole country, you never saw a billboard advertisement for anything. Nikolai Ceausescu became a member of the Communist Party as a teen in 1932. He was first arrested in 1933 at the age of 15 for street fighting, and for the next 10 years, spent his life in and out of prisons and prison camps. In 1943, he was transferred to Teguzhu internment camp, where he shared a cell with Romania's future dictator, Gergu Desch. By 1954, he became a full member of the Politburo, and in 1967, the communist head of Romania. Was it sheer luck or damnable fate? In 1971, Ceausescu was inspired by the personality cults of North Korea's Kim Il-sung and China's Mao Zedong. Shortly after returning home, he began to emulate North Korea's system. Ceausescu created a pervasive personality cult, giving himself such titles as the genius of the Carpathians, and even had a king-like scepter made for himself. In January of 1972, Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev and his KGB chief, Yuri Andropov, believed the West was eager to encourage the least sign of thought in a communist leader. In order to test this theory, they wanted to build Ceausescu up and make him a big box office success in the West through Glasnost. A man like me is born only once every 500 years, Ceausescu would proclaim over and over again after that. That was his Glasnost. And unfortunately, I was deeply involved in it. A French historian of Romanian origin and political scientist once said that the tragedy of the Cold War is that we have a, a rivalry between an amoral power, i.e. the Soviet Union, and a moralistic power, the United States. Okay. It was very, it's very hard for 
moralistic people, for people like Jimmy Carter to some extent and others, to really believe that those whom you talk to are lying. Lying, simply lying. Since you grew up with the idea that to lie is a sin. It, you cannot think that to lie is a virtue in the mind of your rival. And this is basically a great Polish philosopher once said, until the West understands that lie is the immortal soul of communism, the West will not be able to deal in a realistic way with the communist threat. Because you deal with, you know, we, we, we speak different languages, it's fundamentally different moral languages. Glasnost meant self-promotion, an old Russian term for polishing the ruler's image. It was regarded as a tool of the black art of disinformation to sanctify the country's leader. For communists, only the leader counted. Glasnost is one of the most secret secrets of the Kremlin. Thus, a devious Glasnost plan for image reconstruction was launched, and Ceausescu followed it to the letter. When Ceausescu came to Washington, he was given a red carpet treatment as if he was a close friend. And uh, this was how clever the whole Soviet operation was in terms of disinforming us into believing that the Romanian intelligence service was separate from the KGB, therefore could work with the CIA. Every time I went to Romania, you know, Romanians would ask me, does America know what's going on with us? When will America come? Does America know what's going on? They were so hungry for hope. They were so hungry. When will our salvation come? Who will deliver us from this nightmare? It was just a country uh, ruled by fear. With all the power I gained, somehow I hoped I might be able to eliminate some of the endemic corruption. I was wrong. The corruption was so ingrained that <coughs> nothing could stop it. Eventually I realized that I too was just as corrupt as the rest of them. Freely I had all their western clothes, drinks, cigarettes, watches, anything else I could possibly want. I realized then that I would have to screw up my courage and break with this evil society. The privilege can generate cowardice. Communist rulers have always been very generous with their spy chiefs until they tired them and killed them off. It proves hard for me to renounce my exorbitant lifestyle, my villa with its swimming pool, my fleet of cars and drivers, and my hunting lodges in the Carpathian Mountains. <coughs> the more I thought about it, the harder it was for me to start down that path of no return. I knew that Chachescu would do everything he could to kill me, so I got cold feet and put aside all thought of defecting. As I was now in the inner sanctum of the Soviet bloc intelligence community, I was sent to Moscow to meet with Andropov, the chairman of the Soviet KGB. He told me about the next step in his Middle East disinformation strategy. <coughs> he called it a petri dish of hatred waiting to be exploited with the greatest disinformation campaign of modern times.